see right away the difference in the size of the beak. Much bigger beak. Latin name reflects that Geospeza magnorostris. Same day, it's about 10 feet apart here that I take these pictures and look. And what's it doing? Looking for seeds. So we compare the shape of those birds, um, and you can see right away differences in those individuals. With evolution and thinking about the process of natural selection, we are designed to tend to think about what's happening within a species, and there are individual variations within the species. Those are the individual variations upon which natural selection acts, which is a funny way Vikram was just talking to me about the use of language. We, we talk about natural selection as if it were an agent, right? And it is not an agent, right? It is, it is everything in this environment, which is hard for our language to wrap its head around. That's just another personification. I'm just digging deeper here. Okay. Um, so we have here a distinction between individuals and two different species. One of the beautiful things that happens in the Galapagos is that when species that are doing similar things, both searching for seeds on the ground, are in the same place, even though we don't see it, they're actually competing indirectly. So it's not like the big beaked bird comes over and says, hey, that's my muffin. Get the fuck away from here. That's mine. It doesn't do that, right? It's just like, yeah, I'm pecking over here, you peck over here, we're cool. All right? But over time, this is a limited resource, and so it's an indirectness. So even though we can see stuff happening here, we have this wonderful web of indirect influences here in the Galapagos. So when Peter and Rosemary Grant come here, they ban the birds. They know which individual is eating what kinds of seeds, how many seeds they're eating, who's mating with whom. It is a remarkable amount of work that they've been doing over an extended period of time. So the story we can tell about these finches is the best story of evolution in the wild. And so this is from um, a summary they did uh, a number of years ago in American Scientist. And you can see here what they've done is they lined up the 15 species of the heads of the 15 species of Darwin's finches. The blue marks represent the two species I was just talking about. So you can see the differences in pointy beaks and blunt, more powerful beaks. Pointy beaks tend to, tend to be good for picking up little soft seeds. The, the big beaks tend to be good for cracking hard seeds during dry, dry seasons. And what's going on here with these lines is this is a hypothesis of evolutionary relationships, a so-called evolutionary tree. And at the base of this tree, so time goes from here, this direction, at the base of this tree is a hypothetical common ancestor. And so over two million years, there's been a diversification throughout the islands of these species. How might that happen? So the model that Grant and Grant proposed is that from the mainland, the hypothetical common ancestors, got to have a few of them, immigrate, ca caught in a storm or something like that. The Galapagos are geologically young and geographically isolated from mainland. Closest land is 1,000 kilometers away. And so we have the birds coming into the easternmost of the island, San Cristobal. And then one of the great things about evolution is the moment that you take a mathematically non-random sub-sample of a population, it's called the founder effect, and you put it somewhere else so it's reproductively isolated. That's the moment you have a different population that's separate and it's genetically dis distinct. This is why islands are so important, isolated islands, for us to see how evolution works. Within the archipelago, then Grant and Grant hypothesized this kind of movement from island to island. It takes a while to do that. Differentiation occurs. You get different combinations of different species here. Over time, you can account for what's happening um, with the bill shape. So the bills are super important for the way of life here, for what um, Darwin called the struggle for existence. Darwin also used the term in the first edition of Origin of Species of descent with modification. He only uses the word evolution once in that first edition, and it's the last word in the book. He avoided it because evolution was associated at the time with a, um, a uh, genetic, uh, uh, excuse me, a theory about uh, development and how de development happened. Um, so it was only later that the term was associated with what he called descent with modification, which is less poetic, but it's actually more descriptive here of what goes on. So what Grant and Grant did is they said, look, um, let's take a look at the relationship between 
that beak shape, so we have sharp beaks up here, blunt beaks here, body size, these are two very important features of animals, of these birds um, on the Galapagos. And let's imagine a thing called adaptive radiation. And that is, here is the mainland relative, right here, and then what we see is that the species occupy a whole bunch of the, what we call a morphospace. Or if you're a computer scientist, you might think about it as a search space, right? A range of possibilities here. And so that's too simplistic a way to think about it. Birds, I'm doing this. Right, we like birds because they've taken these and made them into wings, right? Fantastic adaptation. Highly successful group, and they do this right when they're on the ground. They don't do, ooh, I want that seed, <laughs> right, with their wing. So what do they do? They have this strange mouth. That bill is made of keratinous tissue like your fingernails. And so I like to think of bird beaks as a hand. So they're walking around with a hand mouth. And was, would Hieronymus Bosch have done something like that? <laughs> a hand mouth bird? I don't know. But probably, actually. Um, so, based on, based on his work. Um, so, this is a manipulating tool, and it turns out that the, these big ones are stronger, and they can break hard seeds. They've done biomechanical testing. <coughs> the little ones are weaker, but they're easier to operate. So, they're finer detail, and they can go into a beautiful connection between the morphology and the biomechanical performance of these guys. This is the story we tell about descent of modification in Darwin's finches. Let's talk about a story of evolution with um, robots next. I want to introduce you to one of um, our kinds of robots called Tadro. So it's a Tadro class model. It's a model T15A, which makes it sound all fancy and tacky. Mm -hmm. And in fact, yes, you are looking at Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we operate on the principle that the best models are the simplest, that elicit the behavior you're interested in. So we start with Tupperware, and here is, this is a surface swimming um, model that's based roughly on the idea of how fish swim. So there's a tail that's in the water that flaps, like a fish tail, and it can change direction of the tad row by changing the offset of that tail. It can change speed by the frequency of that tail flapping. If I show you a picture of from looking down here, we've got two eye spots located on the side. These are not object forming, they just can tell intensity, which can be used with the right kind of neural wiring to do navigation towards a light source. And up top here, this thing that I've labeled a mouth, which is another photoresistor, which is just harvesting light energy. So this particular model is set up to do kind of what the finches were doing, but in water, which is just Look around for food. Collect food when you get it, where the light is the equivalent of the food. Take a look, and we um, break the flavor seal here on our Tupperware. <laughs> you can see what we've preserved inside. This is a microcontroller. It's a tiny Duino, if you're into Arduinos. It's a stack in there, actually. This is a little computer that's programmable, electronic computer. And the idea of a controller is you can take sensory input, there are ports for that, and then you have motor output so you can Take, you can combine with your neurocontroller the information, the patterns you're detecting with your sensors and convert those into actions for your motor output. So that's what's happening there. And what do we have programmed in? In this particular piece of evolution that we've done, we have a, um, a neural network. It's a recursive neural network if you care about that kind of stuff. And left and right eyes are the inputs. The outputs are that offset I was telling you about and the frequency, and the stuff in the middle, this is a fully connected net right now, before there's had been any evolution. There are 60 different connections that are possible in that neural network. <clears throat> Those connections can be ex excitatory or inhibitory. We don't pre-program that neural network. We let evolution through the feedback of performance and reproduction do the programming, if you will, by selecting the patterns in that neural network. There's a genetic code each one of those wires has a, a genetic locus in an artificial string of numbers that is coding for being the present, absent, and its excitatory or inhibitory nature. All right, so let's take a look now 
and these things in action. So in the first generation, we create 10 individuals who have random, we use mutation, they have random patterns of neural wiring. Okay? So this is in many ways unlike, this is not like what happened with the finches, right, where a non-random subset goes out beyond this. This is random. So it's a hard starting point for evolution. What I've got here is a view of our tank, which is three meters wide in our laboratory. And the reason I've got this ellipsoid here is to show you where the center of the tank is, which is not obvious from this oblique perspective of the camera. You can see there's a reflection of the light. And so we're looking for the robot, if it's doing well, to go into this circle. And this is a randomly generated individual, and I'm going to tell you it doesn't do very well. Just an example. So here we put it, put it in the tank, and it's autonomous, right? Nobody's, we're not um, breaking Lucy's, um, whatever you want to call it, wall of, uh, of illusion here. This is the whole thing. There's nobody standing in the background doing anything. We're just watching, right? Um, and they're about as exciting as Darnold Finches, <laughs> which is why I'm not even playing in real time. Um, well, oh, that's good. It goes right to the light. Well, it's kind of pointed at the light. That doesn't Mm -hmm. Oh, look, it's just hanging out at the walls. <laughs> it's not going into the light. It's not doing very well. Now, one of the cool things about working with robots is we can actually measure and log the inputs of the robot. So, right here, we have time on the x axis. On the y axis, we have the intensity of light that's being harvested by that mouth. Okay? And so you can see, oh, look at that. It went through the light. And then do, 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 do. It's not eating. It's not doing very well. We measure this thing we call evolutionary fitness, omega, of the jth individual in the kth generation. I just like saying jth and kth and i things like that because I have a slight speech impediment. And so I'm like a natural statistician, I think. <laughs> um, we take the integral of that intensity um, with respect to time. So it's just the area under the curve if you've avoided calculus. <laughs> um, let me compare this to, let me show you the best individual that evolved in our generation. So that's nine, uh, 10 generations down the road. We started at generation zero because my computer science colleagues all start counting at zero. So nine is actually 10 for most of us. So this is 10 generations down the road. Evolved network, and watch what happens here. It's the same. There we go. So it gets the same start, it's heading towards the light. No big deal, looks the same, but now watch. It bounces off the wall, and then it comes right back into the light. And then it's going to do a, a tight turn. Oops, a tight turn. Look at that, it's orbiting around the light, doing a pretty good job of hanging out at the light. And because we've got this ability to Look at what it's eating. We can see it's doing a much better job of eating. Lucy, can, can you just clarify the feedback here? I mean, so so the uh, positive is it actually recharging from light? I mean, no, it's not. So what defines being in the light as the the good? <laughs> um, the humans. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so, and how do you reinforce that? Um. Yeah, we do that if, by reinforcing how does that feed into yeah. evolution. So this equation here produces a number that's different for each individual. So we have 10 individuals in each generation. And based on their relative amount of light that they get. So here's one of the cool things about natural selection. It's not an optimizer in the sense of any global optimum. Right? Natural selection doesn't know what, here I am personifying again, but this is how we talk about this. It doesn't know what's best. What, the, what happens is we have to get to this point of what biologists call differential reproduction. Because that's the sorting engine that happens. Right? If everybody, all the individuals, breed and have the same number of offspring, that's not selection. And that sometimes happens. Right? If the world is really good, everybody gets to breed. Selection is a differential there. So we use this fitness number to bias essentially a roulette wheel that we spin on the computer that selects different probabilities or a different mating probabilities, like the wheel of fortune. 
So if you're the best one, you have a big slice of pie. You're like the $10 or whatever it is on the Wheel of Fortune <laughs> thing here. And the chances when we roll that wheel that you're going to get to mate or you're going to get to reproduce or hop. Does that address? Yeah. Oh. That, that is, yeah. Okay. And then the reproduction is that something with that neural network gets to be programmed into the next generation of mate? Absolutely. Okay. So what happens is we... The, if you get selected to mate, we take the genes that are just a representation of your neural network. And we say, okay, if there was no mutation, you would just put your neural network into an offspring. But we know that when you replicate the genome, there's a chance there's going to be a mutation. So we put it through what's called a, uh, a mutation operator, which is essentially just for each one of those 60 wires to go, we flip some coin and it's a multi-sided coin. So like if you play Dungeons and Dragons, it'd be like one of those you know, gazillion type die. And so we flip that thing and we say, hey, is it going to mutate? And so we do that for everybody who reproduces here. So um, thank you. These are really good questions um, going forward. So what this looks like then is these are, we've now got, in, I'm going to show you in columns each generation. So these are the randomly generated ancestral populations. The color coding here is the color, the intensity of this sort of, I've learned recently that I'm a slight, um, I'm going to self-consciously now look at my clothes. I have a slight <laughs> color um, loss problem in my eyesight. So, okay, I don't think I'm clashing, but I don't know actually. <laughs> um, so, these, I don't know if they're brown or orange. I think we're going to go into orange here. But the higher intensity of this color is means that the, the fitness number was higher. So we just talked about how you have to have variation among your individuals for selection to act. And we've got that variation through random generation here. So each one of those individuals to get that color had to go through the testing in the lab to see how well it could do life. And then... Over those, the total of 10 generations, we generate this, what to you and I kind of looks like a family tree, right? So this is microevolution. You get to look at each one of the little events here that happens over generational time. And the bummer for people, right, is individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. Individuals are selected, but it's the population that changes over time. And you can see, by the time we march up here after 10 generations, we get to this 10th generation. Here's the one you looked at right there, bright. God, it's not brown or orange, is it? No. I don't know. Whatever color that is. Red, red, red. Dark color. Dark red. <laughs> um, it, that, that individual was the one you saw, and it wasn't the one it, it came from was not the one I showed you. I showed you this one right here, which had an intermediate fitness but didn't produce any offspring here. And so you can see by the time we get down to this population, there's a lot more color here. And so here's our fitness scale. So the population has gotten better at harvesting food, but only certain individuals have reproduced. So here's this differential reproduction we were just talking about. Not everybody gets reproduced. In fact, the seven individuals here are all from a single descendant here. So we start to have these branchings that are the hallmark of evolution, right, over time. And so one of the great insights of Darwin, he, you know, he didn't come up with the idea of evolution. Um, people uh, were discussing evolution, transformation of species well before Darwin's time. What he came up was, with was a mechanism, the natural selection. And so one of his great insights was, look, these kind of small little incremental changes are sufficient, given enough time, to cause the big changes that we see that differentiate species in dramatic ways. This is a really important principle, the principle that Microevolutionary mechanisms are sufficient to cause macroevolutionary change. And enough time, thank goodness Lyle was working on his geological gradualism at the time, um, as opposed to catastrophism, right? And so gradualism says that geological processes, the wearing away, the erosion, and things like that. These are the processes that give that are slow. So I told you 700,000 years with not, nothing in geological time, right? And this is part of this geological thinking, right? Geological time is not organic time because we experience these things on a much different scale. So 
We can do the same kind of thing looking now at a kind of adaptive radiation idea. So there are, when we start looking at neural nets, thanks to all the work going on in the Human Connectome Project, everybody's trying to come up with a different measure of what matters in neural structure. So we picked two sort of simple ones. One is called Q, modularity of a neural network. Modularity is how isolated are the different elements. So you can think about how many sub-elements there are. So in a fully connected net here, the modularity is zero. Okay, because it's fully connected. So fully, you can think of it as integration here. And anybody know the cure? Disintegration on um, here. Here we go now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have disintegration along this axis, in which is really a forming of subunits there. Sparsity is as this number increases, that's just a removal of connections. So a fully sparse network has no connections in it. And so you can see that there's some intermediate values that we would expect to be the best. You move all the connections, that's not going to work well there. You fully pull everything apart, keep all the connections, but they're not talking to each other. So you can't fully disintegrate. So there's some middle ground that should be good. It turns out when people are taking analyses of our connections, I mean, we have, what, 11? Uh, 10 to the 11 neurons, 10 to the 12 connections. We don't have all the connections mapped yet. So when you look at um, the connectome of humans, we're looking at modularities around 0.25, right? So somewhere down in here, it seems to be organic modularities. Now, one of the great, another great thing about working with robots that doesn't work with evolution is we can say, well, you know what, we got a really simple world here. It's simpler than the Galapagos. It's just a light hanging in the tank, right? We humans should be able to know what's going to be the best robot in this environment. And so we say, aha, this is going to work out really well. So the light on the left eye, green is excitatory. And uh, if there, there's light on the left eye, what happens? Here's the offset. So it's positive. So the closer I get to the light, imagine the lights here, is the offset is turning. So if I'm in the light, I'm good doing this. The other one is got a red in it, which is inhibitory. So I'm going to slow down. So if I don't have any light, I'm moving around quickly, trying to find the light in this environment. I get into the light, I slow down, and I start spinning like this. So we can do that, right? So that engineered non-evolved network here, which is sparse, because there are only four connections, and it's modular, it turns out it has a value of 0.5 in modularity and a very high sparsity there, is um, an optimum that we can know ahead of time. So, what this allows us to do is draw a line here between fully integrated and an engineered solution and suggest that this whole morphospace is not available to these tadros. So we're expecting the evolution to be somewhere in this quadrant, okay? Um, somewhere in the vice quadrant. Any steam powered giraffe fans? <laughs> no, um, okay, so this cloud of gray points here represents the 100 individuals that we evolved over 10 generations in the laboratory. So you can see the modularity is pretty low, right? The sparsity is starting to get high here. So the random individuals would be down here, and then you saw things getting better there. So there was a, here's a, 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 the best of all network I showed you. Really interesting, right? You can see the sparsity. There's not even a connection to the frequencies. It's just the offset. So that's not what we predicted. Random and deterministic processes working together in complex dynamical systems, even something like the bathtub in our lab, you get these surprises where, okay, this process, which doesn't really have an agent, but it does because we're humans acting as the non-agent agent in the supervisory mode here. You know what? So what this evolved one does that you saw, it's just constantly going at a speed. It gets to the light and it turns in the light, this kind of thing. So it's just... Not going to worry about a control aspect here. Simplify the neural control is what has evolved. And so what we can do in this kind of environment is predict a directionality, the evolution with selection in it. right? And so we can expect, if we were to continue these experiments, that the population over time would find its way to that 
engineered point there. And some of you may, may have figured out, I just want to point out that um, if you can imagine not moving at all, right, having a sparsity of one and a modularity of zero, and you can do this with a robot too, we can just put it under the light and it gets more light than any other situation. The problem is that's impossible because that's asking the robot to Star Trek itself up and beam down right in front of the light. And the whole point of this is, and that's Teresa's point about having a body, you can't just do that. Um, we love working in digital simulation, and um, I'm going to piss off any computer scientists here, and I apologize, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Every simulation is doomed to success. Okay, so you can do anything you want in a simulation, and by definition, they're violating the laws of physics. When we do embodied robotics, you get the physics for free. You don't have to model it. But you also can't violate the physics. And we do this all the time in physics class, right? Like, there's no friction on this block as it's moving up the slope. <laughs> okay, makes the calculations easy. <laughs> all right, so we have this descent with modification thing going on <coughs> with our robots. And what I want to do here now is uh, take a step back from these, these two examples of animals and robots evolving. And I think, Lucy, this addresses some of the things you were bringing up. Um, in this subfield of evolutionary robotics that we call evolutionary biorobotics, right, which is trying to serve the modeling needs of biologists, humans do tons of stuff. right? So we determine the body plan. I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in a second. Number one, we determined which traits were going to evolve. You know, we preordained that neural network basic structure. We determined the genetics, how it was going to be encoded, the mutation, how many sides on our dice, and so forth, so forth, the reproductive mode, the development, population structure, how many individuals, that kind of thing, the environment, the fact that we have a tank with a simple light source, and then the selection, right? We determined what mattered here. And so if we think about a kind of life cycle of robots, which starts to get people nervous, don't talk to me about a life cycle of robots, <laughs> unless you're Hod Lipson, who's at Columbia, who's actually working on machines, making machines, and is actually trying to close this life cycle. Um, but this is all done by humans here. What do robots do? Our, our autonomous robots enact the behavior that you saw on the video. Okay, That's their job in this. Now, what's... <clears throat> Back to Lucy, what I really appreciated about, one of the things I appreciated about her talk from yesterday, which I hope you got to see, was the fact that when you see demos of robots, there's usually something missing, right? And I would contend, as I said in my comment, it's not that the scientists are trying to hide something. It just doesn't make what producers and directors think of as good TV, right? Um, because they're trying to tell a story, and they're trying to tell a story quickly. So I understand the constraints of that. Um, so all this stuff, right, even though I said, showed you that picture of the video, which was this, I said, we're not hiding anything. Well, I think that's bullshit. We are hiding all of this, <laughs> the body, which is Lucy with her bullshit detector. So I'm like, yeah, you know, hey, John, you know, hold on here, okay? So um, there is all this stuff happening. It's just happening in software and a computer, so it's not like there are cables connected or anything like that or anybody remote control. So, um, I just want to make explicit the role of humans in the evolution of robots. Now, that top thing I said was all about body plans, and I didn't talk to you at all about why in the world do we pick Tupperware, right, is a, for this class of robots here. And this doesn't look like Tupperware at all, but I'm going to show you this thing, an animal, a shark that we worked on in the laboratory. This is um, swiney dogfish. They're found in the North Atlantic here. They never get bigger than about this. Sometimes if you eat shark, um, if, the, if you're eating... Um, the steaks would be about this big. See how you have to talk to you. It's food. Everything's food, right? If it's not food, we're not interested. So the steaks are about this big. Or you get a fillet, they're nice fillets. Also, you use shark, the liver, to make preparation H. I'm not kidding. Look at the ingredients shark liver oil. Okay. Um, so these are beautiful animals. I worked on them in Maine, on Mount Desert Island Biological Lab. What I wanted to do is just highlight the fact that animals are complex, and we know this, right? They have a hierarchical structure system. So I can take you inside that animal here. Um, so I've dissected here and shown you 
the main axial skeleton structure, which is the vertebral column. So they're vertebrates, so they share, like with us, a backbone. We can go deeper, meaning a higher magnification, take a close-up of that skeleton, a beautiful section here done by my colleague Harold Preby in Bergen. And what this is showing you is, here is the black stuff here are actually collagen fibers that have been stained to show you collagen. The white stuff here, these, these sort of U-shaped, lazy U's, are elements of the skeleton, right? This thing has been sectioned. And so if we go even closer in magnification, I hope what you can see here is these collagen fibers actually weave together the skeletal elements, right? It's, when you start asking, when you start thinking about decomposing animals into their parts, it gets hard. Where's, where's the skeletal element? It's there. You know, because you dry a shark skull and you go, oh, here's the vertebra, right? Well, but that vertebra is connected by these other things. So animals are woven together, right? It's, it gets challenging to think about an organ and tissue level what's a part. I'll talk to you about some other ways to think about animal parts here in a second. In addition, there's this stuff in the middle of the vertebral capsule, which is kind of jelly and gooey if you have ever cut up, cut up on a fresh shark. And you think, oh, that's <laughs> snotty. I'm not going to look at that. Well, that <laughs> snotty stuff is really interesting. We go to the final scale I'm going to show you here. Those, it kind of looks like a honeycomb. Those are actually cells. They are vacuolated cells, meaning a vacuole is a sac that holds other stuff inside of a cell. The cell machinery is on the outside of that vacuole. Right? The, most of the, when we think of the cell, has been squished to the periphery of these vacuolated cordocytes, they're called. What in the world is going on? This is a great example. Let me try this um, quote on you. Of why we're ugly bags of mostly water. <laughs> From... Star Trek! Thank you. <laughs> Star Trek, yes. We're ugly bags of mostly water. So we think of, you know, we see skeletons and they're dry and things like that, and we're vertebrate centric, so we tend to think about bones. But in fact, life and body design is the fact that we've got the, all these bags of fluid around. Well, what the heck's going on with that? This is a chemical factory here. Chemistry is easy to control, it can be easy to control if you've got a container, you have semi permeable membranes and things like that, and you've got a solution for the chemistry to happen. So at this level, cells are about packaging the chemistry. It turns out there are also cool biomechanical properties of this stuff. When we disrupt the cellular structure and we measure the stiffness of a backbone, we find that it decreases. So the wiring together of these things also has a mechanical function. So a bunch of things are going on here, but ultimately it is wet and floppy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Now, this is very different than how we engineer stuff, right? So here, a body plan of an even simpler tad rail than the one I showed you. So this is this turns out to have been modeled on, there's some larvae of um, chordates. So we're in phylum chordata, and there are invertebrate chordates, so marine organisms that have a, and, and so sea squirts, if you've ever heard of sea squirts, they have a single eye spot, which is really interesting, because I tell engineers, so we have a robot that can navigate up a light gradient with a single eye spot. And I love engineers, and I hate engineers. <laughs> um, sorry, I just went to Clueless. I love John. I hate John. <laughs> that um, I love engineers. I hate engineers. So you say to an engineer, I've got a robot that can swim with a single eye spot. And they say, no, you don't. <laughs> And I say, no, really, it's based on an animal that has a single eye spot and swims and can orient to a gradient. Yeah, you don't really understand what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, because it's not in their textbooks, right? And engineers are incredibly talented, and they're really good at looking up principles that they can apply. It's not in the book, right? And the reason it's not in the book is you have to have two eyes so you can take a difference. How in the world do you take a difference with a single eye? Well, guess what? These guys, they tend to rotate. <laughs> they spin. And in spinning, they're taking a spatial temporal difference as they spin. 
and they adjust the radius of their spinning based on the light intensity. Simplest kind of autonomous critter we can think of. One sensor, one motor output. So what's inside here? Well, there's an Arduino. This is not a um, micro Arduino, this is 25 bucks. I'll send you the instructions for building one of these if you like. Here's a photoresistor, servo motor, a shaft that's to hold whatever kind of tail you want to put in there. Um, and you can take apart, just like we did with the robot, you can take apart the motor. There are gears in a servo motor. There's a sensor, which is pretty cool in the servo motor. So you tell the servo motor where you want it to be and it tries to get there. So there's a motor and a sensor in that thing. It's very cool. There's also, at the next level, there are integrated circuits. Those integrated circuits have silicon layers and things like that. So it's not that machines don't have structural hierarchy. They do. It's that every one of these pieces is dry and boom. Every one of these pieces is dry and rigid. Okay? And so, in fact, part of the reason we did this on the surface of the water is when you want to take a robot underwater is the moment you start wasting a lot of money. <laughs> because water and electronics, they don't like each other. So that's a really fundamental difference between animals and robots. So we can put them, here's a tad row, head to head here, and do a comparison thinking about parts. Okay? So we've got the kind of solid state of robots, and we have the kind of fluid state of animals here. And we can think about parts in this way. And of course, this is an oversimplification. Okay? There are exceptions to all of this. Each part in a robot or a machine usually has one function. The screw that attached the top of the servo motor, its job is to hold the, the servo motor down or to press down. Right? That's what it does. As I showed you with the cells in the middle in an animal, it's a chemical factory, so it's got stuff going on biochemically as well as it's got a mechanical purpose and things like that. Each part in a machine is designed separately. We didn't sit down when we designed our tad rows and say, we need to design screws. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? Screws have been around, actually. I know an engineer who actually worked at Siemens designing new screws. So I can't say that, you know, screws are done um, in terms of innovation. <laughs> but he did leave engineering because of that job. <laughs> and I, I won't tell you that he was screwed. But I'm, not, I'm tempted. Um, and so each one is designed separately. And then in animals, of course, what's happening is all those parts are designed what I'm calling cooperatively, not cooperatively, as we'd say, but cooperatively. But everything has to operate at the same time, right? And the selection is acting in part on whole individuals. We had an interesting discussion yesterday about Dawkins. Um, who was it? That was it Catherine who brought up um, Dawkins? There was a critique, I think, of Dawkins. Is Catherine up here? Pardon? It was Kathleen. Kathleen, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and so there's a critique there about where selection acts and how it acts. Each part is optimized. Why? Because engineers are really good at figuring out best designs here. Each part in an animal suffices. It just has to get along. You know, we just have, just have to be okay. The way selection works is like, you know, the joke about like two people out hiking. Like, um, well, what are you going to do in case the you know, are you worried as the bear shows up? No. Why are you worried? Because I can run faster than you. Right? <laughs> uh, it's the same kind of thing. It's like in the way the selection acts, as I showed you, you just have to be better at getting seeds than the other birds there. Right? <laughs> and the same thing where it's like for those of you who are graduate students or on the job market, you always want to know, like, from mentors, like, do you think I'm going to get this job? And your mentor can honestly say, you're really good, you're very competent, you should apply. Yeah, but you think, am I going to get this job? And what you have to say is, you have no idea, because you don't know who else is applying. Right? And it, that's what it boils down to. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, specific, right, since you were over here yesterday. So um, it's the same kind of thing. It's context dependent. And that's what we're talking about here with so much of biology is context. Right? What are, who are the other individuals that are with you? Where's the place and the time that this is happening? Engineering tends to separate itself, work hard to separate itself from context. 
And you can see this in the following characteristic of parts. In engineering, the whole part is the whole point of parts is to standardize them. So whatever screw you pull out of the bin is going to work exactly like another screw that you pull out of the bin. Not what happens here for biology. What would, an engineer would call a bug, biology calls a feature, right? <laughs> which is it's the variation that is constantly <laughs> testing out new kinds of beaks, right? And so. How can, you, how can you keep up with a changing environment unless you're testing out new designs? That personifies and teleo makes teleological something that's not, right? But the idea, if you want to think about, one way to think about evolution is, I just mentioned that it's populations that evolve. And we talked about these adaptive search spaces, if you will. You can think of evolutionary processes as a swarm algorithm. It's not a great one, because one of the problems, so-called, from the engineering point of view of, of evolution is it's always one step behind, right? And it's not predictive, because it's always like, well, what's the generation now? What's the variation that's inherent right now? And then differential reproduction happens. Next generation comes, like what goes on in the Galapagos is, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a dry year, big beaks that can crack hard seeds, good. You reproduce more because you can get more energy. Set up, baby's born, next year happens, it's an El Nino year, <laughs> right? And if they had human-like characteristics of an annoyance, <laughs> right, they would go, shit, <laughs> picked the wrong beak size here. Got this big beak, and I can't get all the little seeds here that are all over the place, so I'm at a competitive disadvantage, all those indirect processes. So we end up asking different questions about parts. You know, in engineering, we're asking, how are the parts chosen and connected? In biology, we ask, how are parts made? And how are they assembled? And I'm gonna, again, forgive me, I'm gonna um, oversimplify here. Um, a robot is assembled by external agents, humans, but I'm gonna call outside-in assembly. Animals are, are grown by internal agents, right? Inside out. The robots I've shown you, we assemble them. One of my colleagues, um, Josh Bongard, who's at the University of Vermont, create, has created the field of developmental robotics. He tends to work in simulation here to try to get animals that are doing animals, listen to me, robots that do this thing that animals do, which is respond as they develop to changes in the world. So one response to the fact that the world is always changing is to have an extended developmental period. So you can kind of tune up your neural nets and so forth as you grow. Okay? So Let's talk for a moment about inside out assembly. And here I'm going to talk about parts, as, as if this, these were animals. And the parts are, I'm going to call them sub agents to the, what we would think of as an individual. One of the neat things about yesterday, right, is recognizing that individual is a construction, given the kind of connection we have. We're never disembodied, we're never a brain with that, we're never an individual without other individuals or without an environment or anything like that. Okay? So these are sub agents sub-agents in this construction of an individual. And here's the wacky thing. There are plans for parts, and that's what this is meant to represent, but there are no plans for assembly. Right? The plans for the parts are in the genome, making proteins and transcription factors. You might say, well, transcription factors, they're kind of like um, plans for assembly, but they're really not, right? Because they can be made anywhere at any time. So what the heck is going on? Well, we can think of Three types of subagents in animals. One, we can think of as scribes. Their only job as agents is to find the DNA, the plans, and make copies of it. So they can replicate. Turns out the copies I'm thinking about here are really RNA. Different colors, I think, different colors, <laughs> um, meaning different versions because they make mistakes in their copy. That's just their job. There's this scribe subagent. There's another kind of subagent called builders. They take the plans for making parts, and all they do is make parts. Okay, so they produce a bunch of parts. And here's where it gets crazy. Okay, we got the parts. Now what happens? If I tell you that the parts assemble themselves, I'm getting right. right I'm now. Let's talk. Bring the engineer in. Come on. <laughs> so the parts self-assemble with help from physics, chemistry, and a third class of 
agent that I'm going to call operators. Things like enzymes, okay? Where an enzyme is a protein that can grab onto two different substrates and catalyze, meaning make faster certain kinds of chemical reactions, okay? But the weird thing, humans, right, we love going around trying to impose our ideas of agency on everything, right? So the, what we learned early in human development, right, you know, the, the peekaboo game, right? Like if anybody were six months old right now, you'd be dying. Right? <laughs> I'd be rocking the audience right now. <laughs> right? Because object permanence is something that we have to learn. And so we have an intuitive physics that comes on board. I don't think we have an intuitive chemistry that comes on board. In fact, we have to drag you guys through chemistry, and it's such a painful experience that most of you decide that you don't even want to say the word after you get through whatever levels, however you talk about it in Canada. You know, I think you say levels here, right? Or is that England? I, we call it grades. Grades. You, you use the word grade? In the Commonwealth, grade is yeah. something. Um, so, we have this chemistry stuff that just happened. So we got the operators, and the operators are neat because, of course, these, these enzymes and proteins and things can assemble into all kinds of crazy assemblages. They can be hierarchical. And what's neat is they produce stuff like scribes and builders. And they produce stuff based on what's available to them, what parts are available. So there's feedback in the system. So this is what, when I'm talking about agents, I'm talking about the ability to sense and respond. So they sense chemically and physically, and they act chemically and physically. Um, just want to take you through here the idea of agency with fish swimming. So I talked about swarms. Swarms are really cool. And um, this is these are pictures I took in the Galapagos of schooling fish. And um, our ideas of swarms and how they coordinate their behavior was generated by a computer scientist, Craig Reynolds. And so um, here's his original model called the Boyd's model. It's based on three rules, come together, don't hit each other, and orient together. A company that um, uh, became um, a sub-company that Hollywood would hire to do things like 10,000 marching orcs <laughs> in uh, Lord of the Rings, based on these kind of principles. So biologists said, thank you, that's really nice. Does it work in biology? And so to think about it in biology, a school of fish, the idea that's central to attraction, avoidance, and alignment is sensing other individuals. Right? If I'm going to be, forgive me, I don't, see, here I go. I probably, I, I don't mean this to be sexist. <laughs> if I'm attracted to you and I move towards you, um, I have to sense that you're here and know that you're present. Um, okay, so recall that ability to sense others and do these adjustments um, a kind of social activity. And so we came up with this idea, what if we strip away the social activity, the ability of fish or swimming things to sense each other? And we can do that with robots. So they can't, we're going to build, take our tadros, they're not going to be aware of other tadros in our tank, okay? And we're just going to have them have their eye spots, there's the light. All they know about the world is that there's a light gradient, okay? Their job is to find the light gradient. So asocial robots, sometimes they just kind of mill around. You know, they're not paying attention to each other. Sometimes this happens. They assemble in a formation. Like we said, we've got to remind ourselves here, right? If you're just observing, humans would say, huh, I wonder how they're programmed to do that. Well, we know because they're robots, they're not programmed to do that, which is totally awesome. So I don't like the word... Um, emergence. Um, Gillen was careful to define it in a way that I found fine yesterday. Thank you for that. The reason I don't like it is because it's usually a smoke screen for we don't have any idea what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so I, I don't want to say this emerged, but we wanted to figure out what was happening. So we designed a study where we varied the density of these robots in there, and we did this important thing, what we call in a simple sense agency. Was one in a seek light 0% of the time, you're just going to move around randomly. That's zero agency. If you're going to seek light 100% of the time, you know, you have a goal. We're going to call that kind of goal 100% of the time. Okay? So, and then we vary it. Now, let me show you a couple of videos. 
here quickly. So this is zero agency. And what's going to happen is, and when the room light goes off, that's an instruction of robots to begin the experiment. And you can see where the light spot is and watch what happens. They don't really go to the light. They just bounce around. There's a random movement. Kind of cool. Okay. Now compare that with this. 100% agency. And the room lights are going to go off, which is their signal. Look what happens. Boom. They come to the light. And what do they do? They bounce around because they can't sense each other. Now watch what happens very quickly. Most of them are going clockwise. There's one that's going counterclockwise. <laughs> now watch what happens right here. Head-on collision. Boom. It gets turned around, and now it's spinning in concert with the other ones. So it's physics of assembly of parts, right? Same kind of thing here. It's the physics. It's the collision, the ballistics here of hitting each other, momentum transfer, that achieves in this group a low energy state, right? You dissipate energy, next thing you know, the, the low energy state is, hey, let's just, let's just take chemistry class, okay? <laughs> you go, you go to chemistry class and then we graduate, right? So you just do this thing. So um, what's lovely about this is we can look at all the patterns and statistically, here's 100% agency over in that right-hand column. You can see how tightly um, all the trajectories of the robots are in that space. So what we can say here is that collective agency can occur through physical mechanisms. So this on the scale of what we would call individuals is an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about happening inside an individual as well. Now, Teresa, um, I think I spent too much time talking about chemistry. I can, I can stop here or I can talk about... Um, okay. So last thing I want to mention up, mention up. We talk like that in the States, because we don't believe in grammar anymore, so we just you know, do whatever. Um, so, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of kind of picking a model and evolving what I'm going to call morphological intelligence. And I'm using that phrase because I'm trying to cause some of you to ask me a question about it later, and I feel like I have good answers, so I, but I'm not supposed to say that out loud. Right. But anyway, we'll see if anybody asks now about morphological intelligence. But um, so the idea is, is here, this kind of, if you will, people are starting, and I'm not kidding you, talking about programming matter as opposed to programming computer software. Okay, so here is an extinct fish, Drepanaspis, like the one that was on the first slide, very close in the size and activity to an electrical brain. I never got your name wrong, Carmen. Carmen, and Carmen, you asked about race earlier before the talk, and so here's that picture I, I said. So here's um, a Tadro, <clears throat> Tadro 4, it's got two eyes, and it's got IR detectors. It's got the ability to sense other agents. The other agents in its world is gonna be a predator. So we call this, because we're so creative, and because we're such big nerds, we call the prey robot, Prey row. <laughs> Isn't that awesome of us? <laughs> and because these are tad rows, we call them predator robot, which is not going to evolve. Here's where we get really creative. Tadiator. <laughs> so we have tadiator and prey row. And so here's a, a schematic uh, photoresistors for navigation, finding the light. So here now we're not going to just feed. We're going to feed and then pay attention for predators, have a social ability, and get the heck out of the way if predators showing up. And we're going to pick three different features to evolve. The span of the caudal tail, the caudal fin. So this is this would be like an eel-like fin, or that's starting to be like a tuna fin here. The number of vertebrae, I showed you vertebrae and sharks. So we can vary from essentially one long thing called a notochord to a vertebral column by varying the number of those joints. And then our IR, IR proximity detector is a predator detection threshold. So we can measure how sensitive this is to an oncoming predator. So I say evolving morphology. These two are really morphological. This is quasi-morphological because, you know, in fish what happens is there's this thing called lateral line that evolves, which is inside out ear, totally cool, don't have time to talk about it, but um, happy to later, uh, that's pressure sensitive. So we have these three things that are have the potential to evolve in concert. 
quick video of this. So you've got Prey Row coming in from the left, Tadiator coming in from the right, and watch what happens here. So Prey Row is going towards the light. Tadiator can sense Prey Row, but turns too late. So Tadiator doesn't know yet that the predator is on its tail because the predator right now is in its blind spot because its predator detection system is on the sides. And now, sorry, I'm down sample this to one for a second. And now what's going to happen is Prey Row catches up, or Tadiator catches up, and boom, collides with Prey Row there. So back to Sue, uh, Lucy's point about how do we pick a fitness function here. So what we're doing in this world is we are rewarding individual prey rows who can stay away from the predator, who once a predator is detected can accelerate, this one missed accelerating, right, and get the heck out of the way quickly, who can swim quickly, getting to the light, and who can once they're at the light, stay at the light. So we're trying to co-reward, if you will, predator avoidance and ability to forage in our fitness function. And here's... To our surprise, what happened? There's a piece of that fitness function which we measure called the distance to the predator. What I'm going to claim is that if you didn't know anything else about this system, and I told you that over generational time, the distance to the predator of the population mean in black was getting, they were keeping further and further away from the predator, we would be saying these animals are evolving, animals, these robots are evolving intelligence, right? They're clearly more intelligent because they're staying further away from the predator. That's a good thing to do. It has nothing to do with the neural net. The neural network here that's driving this system is invariant. We're not evolving it. It's another cool thing to do with robots. Only those three characters. Okay, so without knowing anything else, you might say, well, of course, it's going to be the predator detection threshold that evolves you, the ability to detect the predator. No, it's not. It's the number of vertebrae. You can see it's directly correlated with that. I'm not going to show you the other statistics and so forth with that. And so, as their ability to stay away from the predator gets better, better, um, you get more vertebrae. Well, what the heck is going on here? I'm going to move this up here, so I'm going to bring in something here. With robots, we can also study things that haven't happened. So we took... Um, a tabulator, and we just changed the number of vertebrae. So we're going to change it from, you know, it's only going to evolve from four and a half to five and a half. Why? Well, let's look over the whole range and do studies of how well they accelerate. Right? How well do you get out of the way? Even though we didn't detect that as a something that's statistically significant in evolution, and what we find is that number of vertebrae is correlated with an increase in acceleration ability. Why? As you add vertebrae, you stiffen that vertebral column. A stiffer structure is stronger and vibrates faster. Okay, so we have a biomechanical connection here. And something else that's really cool, you can see there's this drop here at six, drops down to seven. Turns out that's for some reasons about how vertebrae abut. But what means what that means here is there's a this population is stuck on this local optimum. Even though you might want to accelerate more. From the external reference frame, right? You get if you get more vertebrae, your actually your performance is actually going to decrease. And we think this happens all the time in real evolution. And it's a sticky evolutionary problem: how you get off a local optimum there. Which is why the idea of a swarm algorithm for searching is, is interesting. So anyway, this is a really I, I'll contend even in these simple systems, these simple models of robots, an attempt to understand the complexities of evolutionary theory. Well, thank you.